This title is Network Space. Network. I think Network Space. Let's keep it simple, don't you think? Sure. Swamp is next week. Um, so a funny thing happened. First of all, how do you like these shoes? They're kind of weird, right? They're Tevas. So I, I'm weird. Uh, you know. um, I can't think if my, shoe, if my feet aren't comfortable. Uh, does anyone have that? So I tend to uh, go barefoot uh, whenever possible. But when that's socially unacceptable, like right now, I try to wear shoes that are basically like I'm going barefoot. Um, so unless you're blogging this, uh, why don't we close uh, devices? Um, so, so, uh, so what's weird about me telling you all about my relationship with shoes? What's weird about that? It's a little awkward. Do you feel that kind of social awkwardness? Like, did I ask about his shoes? Why is he telling me about his shoes? It's not normal for a lot of people to understand my taste in shoes. So that's, I'm using this to illustrate how strange it is to have a lot of people knowing about my preferences in shoes. And I'm not finding it now. But um, have you ever had this thing, maybe if I go on Amazon, have you ever had this thing where you searched for, I don't know, shoes? And um, you did a search, and then a week later, you're just in the internet, and there's all these ads, and it's for the same shoes. Well, that's what happened to me. Has that ever happened to you? Vinny says that's happened. Has anyone else had that happen? How weird is that? The first time it happened, it's weird, right? Well, what do we say now? Well. It's normal now, right? So, um, speaking of weird, let's stay here, please. Okay. So this is the I'm I'm using my shoes, and the awkward weirdness of sharing that information of my preference in shoes with a lot of people. At least I know you. At least we know each other. We have a social, uh, uh, we're, it's normal for us to engage socially. We see each other. We, you know, I know you see my shoes every twice a week. So it's not so bizarre. But how many people, how many companies around the world now have access to this information about my preference for shoes? It's a little weird. What if you went into a store? Name a store that you've gone into lately. TSW. TSW. What's that mean? The shoe warehouse. The shoe warehouse. Okay, so you're going into the shoe warehouse. Pretty good, huh? Acronym. Oh, designer, designer shoe warehouse. Two points. Okay. So we go into design shoe warehouse, and... Um, you, you go in, right, and you go to the right aisle, and you start looking at shoes, and then someone comes up right behind you, and they have a clipboard, and they're watching what you're looking at, and they take notes. Okay, she looked at the black ones. Oh, she looked at the, the, the spiky heels, and then she, she made a face. She didn't stay with the spiky heels for very long. She spent three seconds with the spiky heels, and then she went to the flats. Yeah, more sensible, because it's better on your spine. And... Uh, and so she went to the flats, and then, okay, and she likes earth colors, okay, she really likes earth colors, and, uh, and then she started looking at the sparkly shoes, uh, you know, and now, and so this person is following you and paying attention to how long you look at every pair of shoes. How do you feel about that? It's creepy, isn't it? Yet... That's what happens every time we shop for anything on the internet. Now, um, 
No one follows us in the store yet. But the way things are going, uh, or so say the authors of our reading, that is perhaps what's going to happen next. Because the internet, which is modeled here uh, in terms of nodes of connection, um, and the specifics of um, the complexity of the networking. I mean, here it seems fairly harmless because it's all abstract and uh, you know it looks interesting, it's kind of pretty, the colors they choose to use. And sure, there's the central node, but the interesting thing about the internet is the central node is not that big. It's not like a, what we imagined, what the science fiction dystopians imagined 50 years ago is that there'd be one big computer buried at the center of the planet, and it would control all human activity. Uh, that's not how it's working out. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like the Dubai dystopia versus the village utopia comparison we did on Tuesday. It's actually turned out to be more like uh, a cluster of villages or distributed, distributed nodes on the network that is all over the world. It's kind of a nice, pleasant thing. The center is kind of small. Not so fast. Even in the networked form, the way capitalism adapts and evolves, it's, capitalism is the ultimate dog looking for the bologna sandwich. Capitalism licks everything it comes in contact with. It sniffs every transaction, every object, every engagement, and it, it bites it. If it tastes or smells like a, play, a way to make money, it bites into it. And it's a machine. It never sleeps. It's constantly moving. It moves from node to node looking for the bologna sandwich of money. Um, so the outcome is that even in the distributed form of this network, it is still acting as if it's a giant brain uh, prying into our privacy, figuring out what our taste in underwear is and everything else about us so it can sell us things that we are more likely to buy. Uh, and this is the new uh, growth uh, industry of capitalism is to know what people want to buy before they know they want to buy it. Steve Jobs. Um, and, and so in the olden days, it was a little different. But um, what was the hottest thing going uh, in the 15th century in Europe? We don't have much time, so I'm going to tell you. How did you know? Spices. So slaves, OK, but they die and they weigh a lot. You can't you fill a ship with slaves. What do you got? OK, eh, I don't know. My brother-in-law told me about this new thing called nutmeg and pepper. Um, much more valuable per ounce. Pepper was the crack cocaine. No, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not up on what's the high commodity. Salt. Yeah, salt. Salt. Yeah, salt. <laughs> no, salt, salt is available everywhere. Okay, forget about the drug analogy. Um, spices. <laughs> Nutmeg, cloves, there was only one place on God's green earth where that stuff grew. It was an island about the size of this area of Boston. And it was the only place on the planet uh, where these things were available. And this was true before we knew it was a planet, we Europeans. The Muslim traders were sailing ships through these seas and bringing spices to Venice, thus Venice, thus you knowing what the word Venice means. If it weren't for the spice trade, you would never have heard the word Venice. Venice was the seat of culture because it made boatloads of money, literally, because that's where the Muslim traders brought the spices. For hundreds of years, uh, the Europeans tried to figure out where those spices were coming from. They were so desperate to find out where those spices were coming from that they launched this crazy idea to, to send this maniac from a port in Spain west, 
across the Atlantic over the side of the Earth. But in case the Earth was round, he would come here and find where the spices were coming from because they heard rumors. That was how America was discovered because they were looking for the spices. Were they looking for America? No, America got in the way of the bologna sandwich of these spices that were the source of the, the vastest wealth anyone imagined at the time. So a boatload of nutmeg, one boatload of nutmeg could launch a kingdom into superstardom. It was worth so much money. Why were Europeans so crazy about nutmeg and cloves and pepper? They didn't have refrigerators. So to, to have a diet that consisted of meat through the winter, you needed to preserve these meats and other food things and uh, to survive uh, and to have a full rounded diet all winter long. Thus, everyone in Europe wanted uh, these spices. They wanted meats that were cured with these spices. They were extremely valuable. Thus, the crazy stuff that happened, um, including, I'll just tell one story, <coughs> when, um, when the Dutch finally found someone to tell them where the spices were, and they got there. They, at one point, they ended up uh, killing everyone on the island except for 12 people, something like that, so that the secret was safe. But they needed the 12 people to keep it going, so they killed everyone else. So they genocide, whatever it takes. So capitalism finds a way, and that was a way. And to make a long story short, Global networks of colonialism, that's the story. In a nutshell, you find a way to uh, make money on these global networks. And so there's a connection between this and this. This is the old version. This is what it looked like uh, for hundreds of years in the past. This is the, it, some would say that this is the new version. Now, the, so that's one important point of this lecture. The second important point of this lecture is that these <coughs> networks, as they did in colonial times, they manifest spatially. There are specific nodes on this network that are physical locations on the surface of the Earth. This one is Shanghai up here. Um, and so this became a very important network uh, in the net, uh, a very important node in the network of global transactions. If this had not existed, vast amounts of, mel of wealth and resource transactions would not have been possible. That is still true in the same location. This is the last photo, was the Bund right here. This is Pudong, Shanghai, here. China has said this is going to become the most important node in Asia, and they're successfully doing it. In both cases, it, the way it happens is through architecture. Architecture and the design of buildings, the design of cities that support those buildings and those operations, and the symbolic content that they carry with them is how these networks operate. Um, here's another one, Grand Central Terminal in New York City. There's something about the, uh, the network flows of people, of bodies moving through this space, uh, that makes it also a very vibrant hub. This is an architectural mixing machine, uh, a, a device for connecting. The, it's a node in the network, and it works brilliantly. And it's very exciting to be part of this and to watch how the bodies move through space. And there are places like this in cities all over the world, and they're very exciting uh, architectural events. Um, now, the other thing that happens is the images, uh, the, uh, and this is the third point, that the way these nodes operate is that uh, European culture becomes global culture. Uh, and uh, Asian culture becomes European culture. It becomes uh, these images, these architectural icons become the currency of exchange for everyone. That's why 
the American television, uh, especially Hollywood and movies and ad agencies and magazines, how all of those things have become the currency with which everyone in the world, including uh, a 14-year-old boy in a refugee camp in, uh, in Nairobi, that's, he uses the same images and the same ideas and the same aspirations to construct his vision of the future as Joshi does uh, in Southern California, whose dad is an actor and starring in the, in the, the advertisements. So it's a global um, interaction. It's a global exchange network that is increasingly interconnected. It's not just the internet, uh, this new uh, flow of connection, and, but it's also not just the spatial flows that were previously dominant of colonialism and exchange, uh, like Venice. It is now, uh, they are influencing, increasingly they are influencing each other. And when you get to the point where you're reading the reading for this uh, topic, you should look at what the authors, it's an interview, it's actually a conversation between two, uh, one's an architectural historian and theorist and the other one is a, a media, um, interactive media designer. And what they are talking about are the, the many ways in which the transforming relationships and norms uh, of privacy and public, uh, like the shoes, how it starts on the internet, and but is now transforming the way we engage with each other in real space. And the surveillance cameras that cover downtown London uh, are just one example of how all of a sudden uh, we are under surveillance every time we enter uh, a certain urban space. Uh, and it's increasingly true in places like college campuses, that there are surveillance cameras in shopping malls. Uh, the entire underground network of the city of Montreal, uh, entire portions of urban fabric are covered by surveillance cameras. They also refer to the fact the August uh, riots in London, they used the surveillance cameras and the software for identifying people's faces to target, figure out the identity of uh, protesters that were engaging in those uh, riots in London. And so it's used as a law enforcement tool it's one very small logical step away from using surveillance cameras to identify people uh, to automatically sending that image to a drone uh, to take them out. We do that. You can buy a drone on the internet. It's not legal to mount it with the kind of arsenal that the US military uses. But when does that come? Uh, when does uh, gun rights extend to the owning of a drone? Um, any day now, I, I imagine, we'll be reading about how uh, uh, owning a drone with guns mounted to it is a protected uh, civil right of, uh, of every American, uh, because we use that for hunting. Um, so uh, those are the main points. Let's stop there.